Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for being here with us today and kind of sitting back and learning with us. This is the first uh, for our team to offer this amazing webinar to you all today. Um, we are all also hoping to live stream to LinkedIn, which is very exciting. We're, we're looking forward to getting this information out to as many people as possible. I am Jennifer Rothman. I'm the director of the Youth and Young Adult Initiatives team at the NAMI National Office. Um, just some quick housekeeping things before we, we jump right in. Um, all of our callers are, are muted. Uh, you won't be able to come on camera or, or talk over your mic. Um, only our presenters and our co-hosts have microphone rights. You can certainly ask questions in the Q&A, or if you just have some, some fun things that you want to share, you can do so in chat. We will be collecting all of the Q&As um, to be able to discuss at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded, so if you have to leave last minute or you won't be able to catch the whole thing, we will be emailing this out to the registrants. Um, so it is with great pleasure that I introduce our speakers for you today. Um, Alex Ang is a content creator and mental health advocate living in St. Paul, Minnesota. In 2022, she was invited to attend the MTV's inaugural Mental Health Youth Action Forum to inform and create youth mental health initiatives. She now sits on the NAMI Next Gen Youth Advisory Board and is the host of a podcast, A is for Anxious. Maybe she'll be nice and share the link with us in chat. In her work, Alex focuses on cultural competency, mental health storytelling, and transforming access. Meg Delp is a licensed marriage and family therapist and director of workplace mental health with NAMI, specializing in burnout, trauma, and relationships. She has provided education to organizations on topics such as psychological safety, DEI, and mental health, burnout, and trauma in the workplace. Currently pursuing her doctorate in human and organizational psychology at Turo University, Meg is passionate about understanding human behavior in professional settings and working to break down the stigma around mental health. Since joining NAMI this year, her work focuses on partnering with organizations to better understand the needs of their employees, build awareness around mental health at work, help create more caring corporate cultures, and provide the resources needed to be more mentally well. And we also wanted to make sure before Meg and Alex get started that we give a special Special thank you to the Hartford, who is a NAMI stigma-free partner, and they are also supporting today's webinar. So, Meg and Alex. Great. Thank you so much for that intro, Jen. Uh, Alex and I are so excited to get started and really dive into this topic. This is the first of three webinars, uh, first of three Next Gen at Work webinars that will be hosting. Uh, we'll have different hosts for each one. It's going to be great. But for this one, we are really taking a deep dive into identity at work and how our identity and our values play together at work, outside of work, all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, let's get started. Yeah, we can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to start off with a little activity, um, you know, to get our brains truly, you know, starting to think about what values look like in the workplace. So get your typers ready, the chats open, um, make sure to direct your chats to everyone so that everyone, everyone can see it and not just hosts and panelists. Um, so yeah, we're going to start out with talking about what you value more in the workplace. So put a heart in the chat if, you know, pay is something that you value in the workplace and type WL um, if it's work-life balance. And then you can raise your hand too if it's other. And then I want to invite people who choose other to, you know, possibly share what they think in the comments, like what came to mind when I asked this question and if it doesn't have to relate to work-life or better pay. Okay, we have a lot of work life. You're yeah, on the so right call. Much work life balance. That's awesome. I also saw being appreciated and valued through recognition. Absolutely. Equitable representation. Fabulous. Great. I see a hand raise for other. 
you want to explain that one, go for it. If not, that's okay. But doing valuable work. Fabulous. Oh, an alignment of values. Well, this is the presentation for you, Gloria. We are here to talk about how important it is that our work really align with the values that we want it to. Fabulous. Any other thoughts before we move right along? Okay. Let's head over to the next slide, please. So we are gonna do another uh, quick activity here, just thinking about a time when you worked somewhere that didn't prioritize your mental well-being or align with your values. Um, just thinking about how that made you feel. You can put it in the chat if you would like to. You can um, just kind of think about this, notice how it's making you feel, what it's bringing up for you. Um, this one is really important to notice in our past jobs, but it also kind of helps us navigate our future jobs as well. So really evaluating how have you been feeling in past jobs, previous jobs, all those important things. Um, yeah. So yeah. And I'm going to share a personal story as well, because this happened super recently. Um, I'm going to share like a story about a time where I was working somewhere that wasn't very conducive to my mental health. And so the summer after I graduated from college, I accepted an internship. Um, it was a research internship. And for that internship, I was required to travel to the West Coast for the first time. And due to a lot of factors, I think just being in an unfamiliar place for the first time, um, and I do have an anxiety disorder and, you know, feeling a lot of the emotions um, from post-grad. The internship itself was also not very conducive, like they required you to work outside of like your normal hours, like nine to five. And so when I think about this question, like, how did you feel? For me, it was like very physical because I would cry every night, right? I would feel kind of physically ill and, you know, have panic attacks during work. Um, so just thinking about this question is too, I didn't really realize there was a problem with prioritizing your mental well-being and aligning your values until I felt these things. So yeah, I see a lot of things that are resonating with other people and, you know, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. Yeah, yeah, it's really, I mean, with Alex's story, with all the comments, it is so clear how much of an impact this can really have um, on our work life, but we're going to take this home with us. We're going to feel these impacts both in and outside of work. So it's definitely important to really keep an eye on how our work is impacting us. All right, next slide, please. So what is our identity? Let's kind of break that down just to make sure we all really are on the same page with what that really means. Our identity is made up by things we both can and can't control, things we can't control, our age, our cultural background, um, our hair color, unless we go to the hair salon, uh, things like that that are just biologically innate with us. Things we can control are things like our values, what we believe is important to ourselves, to our families, um, and then the relationships we create. Those are some things that we can control. We can kind of dictate our identity in those ways. Um, so it is important to acknowledge some of these things, some of our identity is not something that can change all that much. However, there is a lot about our identity that is very changeable and will probably change every year, if not every day, just depending on our mood. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So Alex and I wanted to give it, uh, our own personal examples of what our identities are. I'll start first. Um, some things I can control. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I worked real hard to get there. I'm also a certified clinical trauma professional and a doctoral student. These are all things that I really identify as that make me feel proud, that I am excited to do every day. Um, these are things that I that align very closely with my workplace values. I value coworkers who value my voice. They want to hear what I have to say. They want to work with me collaboratively. Um, they want to hear my feedback and they want to provide me feedback. 
I really value my relationships with my coworkers. I also really value having autonomy to use my creativity. Um, even this presentation, right? Like Alex and I worked on it for the past couple of weeks. We were able to be creative and make it our own. I love being able to do that. I love having trust from my coworkers to use my creativity and uh, build presentations and resources, things like that. I also really value leadership who listens to their employees. This can look like a lot of different things. Uh, one example from NAMI that we literally just had last week was an engagement survey where they sent out an anonymous survey. We got to fill out how we were feeling, what we were hoping to see, what we were appreciating, what we wanted to do differently. I really value an organization, a company that wants to hear from their employees about what they're doing well and what can be improved. Um, and finally, we, many of us said this in the chat already, work-life balance. It is huge for me. I value my friendships outside of work. I value hanging out with my husband and my dog and being able to read and having energy left over at the end of the day to still do other things besides work while also really being able to be engaged at work in a really awesome, positive way. Yeah. And, you know, thank you, Meg, for that. And in sharing my identities and kind of my values, I want to see, I want you guys to notice too, like how it differs and how we all have very different identities. And for me, I sort of see, you know, myself as a mental health advocate in this space. I am also a member of NAMI Next Gen, which is our youth advisory board. And then Meg and I are both a part of um, NAMI's Stigma-Free Advisory Council um, for workplace mental health. I, in my day job, I'm a full-time social media manager, but I'm also, you know, a content creator who does a lot of freelance content creation on the side. And some of my values, they also align with some of Meg's, is a space to express my creativity. You know, I'm a creative at heart and I need the work, my workplace to reflect that. I need to be able to, you know, speak how I, you know, am creatively. I also learned that through like the pandemic and going through like, you know, school online is that I really value a flexible working schedule. And that means, you know, having time away from screens and, you know, my employers knowing that, you know, remote, remote work options are what is most suitable for me. I also value a commitment to DEI. Um, and this is purely from experiencing, you know, being the only woman of color in an organization and experiencing the microaggressions that have come from that. And so that's something I truly value. And then the last thing is also prioritizing work-life balance. For me, what that means is, and we'll, we'll talk about this later too, is that work for me isn't everything, you know? And at the end of the day, I want to be able to work and find my purpose at work, but also find my purpose as Alex, you know, who I am outside of being an employee. So yeah, if you go to the next slide. All right, so we kind of hinted to that. We talked about ourselves. So what does identity in the workplace look like? Well, for some people, like I said for myself, your work doesn't define you. And I think this is especially true for, you know, young people, right? And I think it's something to understand that I think as young people are starting to move into the workforce, we are moving away from this idea of a dream job. And, you know, there are many factors that are contributing to this. I think a few is obviously the pandemic, but I think that has caused a shift in priorities, right? Like we want to be closer to our family. We want to have time to be more social with our friends. I think another one is changing in career paths. You know, maybe we're graduating or we're moving into the workforce and realizing that the thing that we wanted to do for, you know, the better half of our life is not the thing that we want to do anymore. And then also personal or familial situations. So for many, like myself, um, work is not you know, work is work is not my life. You know, it's a means to an end to receive a paycheck at the end of the day. And sometimes it may not support your passions and your hobbies or what you're interested in. So for many, their identity is not tied to like their place of work. Um, but then on the other hand, work may also be a place that aligns with your values and who you are as a person. And for many, it's an, it's a place to like explore your identity. And who knows, you might find out that like you're a better leader than you thought, or, hey, maybe you really like this job that you didn't major in in college, right? But you're really enjoying the work and it's meaningful to you. So work can be a place where you feel seen and valued as an, you know, not just as an employee, but as person. So, but it's not one or the other. And I feel like a part of that is like working in the first place to really figure out your identity. Next slide. 
Yeah. So another, you know, interactive kind of activity. So we'd love to know like in the chat, what work means for you. I think that's really meaningful. And kind of the whole reason for this webinar as well in this series is really honing in on what work means to you and what your identity is. Um, and the answer is gonna vary for me. Like I said, work is a place where, you know, I feel like I am fulfilling a purpose, but it maybe not, might not be like my life's purpose, right? But I'm earning, you know, enough to support my lifestyle. And I'm not ashamed to say that, you know, the job I'm working in now is not my dream job, but it does align to some of my values. But yeah, Meg, I wanna know what work means for you. For sure. So this has definitely evolved over time. Uh, before I became a therapist, I had 14 jobs from high school to therapist, <laughs> and they were all very, very different, and they each aligned with different parts of my identity, different parts of my values. Um, when I was younger, like high school age, it was about the paycheck, but I got a job at a retirement home and ended up loving it. I ended up loving working with elderly people, hearing their stories. And that actually really ramped up this feeling of wanting to be a therapist. And so, you know, over time, work has looked different for me in various ways, but it feels like there is always a little bit of my identity, a little bit of my values in each one. It wasn't until I became a therapist that it really felt like it clicked into place, like, yes, we all need to make money and being a therapist was really aligned with my identity, who I felt I was, what I wanted to do. And so sometimes it can take a little bit of adjusting, a little bit of figuring out like, well, I like this job for these reasons, this job for these reasons. How can I use what I've learned to really hone in on a job that answers a lot of these questions for me? Um, so yeah, being a therapist definitely felt like it's when it my identity and work kind of clicked into place together. And then even that started to evolve as I found organizational psychology. And now I find myself at NAMI. So even after finding something that aligns so well with my identity at age, I believe that was 25, even since then it's changed over the past few years. So, you know, I think it's important to always be open to notice how your identity is shifting, how your values are shifting and being open to see what that looks like with work. I'm loving all these values in the chat. Work is something I should be enjoying. Absolutely, eight hours should be like two hours. Yes, love that. Work allows me to practice my passion. Awesome. Oh, a teacher, fabulous. Passionate about the job, love it. Yeah, Meg, I like how you said how you just showed a true example of like how your what work means for you has changed. And I think that is the case for a lot. But I think it's like about giving yourself grace and like not beating your, yourself up too much about if one of your values change. For sure. Yeah. And we learn so much about ourselves all the time, but also about how the work world really functions. Um, but then also even world events can change our values. So yeah, always keeping an open mind about what's coming next for you can be really helpful. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. So let's look at some stats for our uh, youth and young adults. So these stats come from a study that was done with the Hartford. Um, and we found that 53% of Gen Z employees report high levels of stress at work. Over half of our young adults in the workplace have high levels of stress. That is so important for employers to know and for us to really figure out where that is stemming from, get them involved in the conversation and figure out how we can make work not a place where there are high levels of stress at work. Some stress, great, healthy. High levels of stress, not sustainable. It's going to create, you know, turnover, decreased productivity, absenteeism, all sorts of problems if we can't work with our Gen Z and figure out how to make work a place that is comfortable and healthy to be at. We also found that 41% of Gen Z employees say that stigma would keep them from seeking mental health support. 
This that really surprised me. I know from being a therapist that my younger clients, they spoke to their friends all the time about mental health, very open advocates. Like Alex, you were saying you're a mental health advocate. There's so much discussion about mental health, but it would appear that this does not translate to the workplace. It, for, you know, the reasons that we've talked about with uh, identity, with values, Gen Z does not feel that they can talk about mental health at work. Um, Alex, I'd love to hear some thoughts from you about, you know, what you've experienced. I mean, you've had negative experiences with this. I'm curious your take on this. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, like younger employees and staff who are new to the workplace, um, like you said, I think mental health, I think also, you know, in other like generations or, you know, people of all ages, like, you know, I think as a society, we're starting to talk about mental health more. And mm -hmm. so, like you mentioned all of this, I think people are start like there's something, there's a switch going off that people are like, okay, something's not right, right? And I think these stats are, show that kind of how, people are feeling, but also how it is keeping them from maybe speaking up or again, why this stigma exists. So actually that's a great segue to the next slide. All right, so I bet like many of us, we've seen, you know, the jarring headlines about young people at work. Um, you know, some of the things, and again, these are all like stereotypes, right? And like how people choose to you know, decide how to describe an entire like generation. They might say like lazy and they say like we demand too much, right? And it seems like for the most part, the world has already decided what our identity looks like in the workplace before we've even had a chance to decide it for ourselves, right? So how how do we how are we supposed to do this? Prior prioritize our values and then you know come up with our identity at work if people already haven't think they have an idea. So the good news is these ideas about work for young people are shifting. And I think this cultural shift is going to have ripple effects for many other generations, for even the older generations who are working in the workplace right now. And like Meg said, people are understanding how mental health is now becoming an important value for, for everyone, right? Especially young people and how that's going to translate into the workplace. So I wanted to share these new headlines to kind of combat all of the ones you've seen, like on Business Insider or whatever. And especially this one where Gen Z grew up talking about mental health and they aren't going to stop talking about it at work, right? And I think this sets a new expectation or or standard. And I especially like this quote from NAMI CEO, Dan Gillison, work isn't just about how we make a living. It's where we find purpose and meaning, build community and develop as whole people. Mental health is critical to achieving all of these. Yeah, you can go to the next one. Great. So let's talk about. Oh, I think this is the. This is yeah. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Oh. Oh, this one right here. <laughs> there we go. There we um, go. So, with all of this, we really want to start diving into how do we take all of this knowledge now about our values, about about our identity, and really start to look for work that makes sense for us and um, really kind of put this into action. Yeah, so, I mean, we promised, you know, tips and, you know, actual thing, actionable things that you can take into your job search or or even like where, how you're working right now, right? So yeah, we're gonna take you through the steps of how to prioritize your values and find your identity in the workplace. And so kind of like in the chronological order, what happens first? Like you start with finding a job. So here are some tips on, you know, how to find a job that aligns with your values. The first one is deciding what your non-negotiables are. So instead of thinking of that as like you, it's not, it doesn't mean you being picky. It means setting boundaries for your employer and your work environment. Another tip is to start looking with, you know, organizations that you know and love. So the job that I have right now is, you know, I, I basically found it through looking at the job boards of organizations that I love, like NAMI. I don't work in NAMI, but that's an example, right? Like if I love the work that NAMI does, you know, look at the job listings on organizations that you already trust and interact with as a consumer. 
The next tip is, you know, widening your network. I think the best part about, you know, social media, and I think how it can contribute to this, you know, in promoting workplace mental health is that nowadays you can connect with basically anyone. So specifically on LinkedIn, you can, can connect with hiring managers, recruiters, or even current employees who are working in the place that you maybe want to work at. And, you know, I've done cold DM and cold email sometime where I'll just reach out to them and ask them about their experience because that's going to help inform me. The next is to lean into your existing network. You know, I'm not ashamed to say that one of the first jobs I got in college was actually through someone who knew me referring me for a job. So, you know, I, I, I felt ashamed at first, but, but then I realized that they know me best, right? Your network knows you the best. They know who you are as a worker. They know who you are as a person. So trust them to, you know, if they have a job for you or lead, you know, lean into your network. And then the next one is, the last one is my favorite, to follow and explore their LinkedIn page. You know, you can learn a lot about a company from the way they engage with their audience, um, you know, especially on social media. So that will also help inform what your expectations are if you work for them. Awesome. So when you are job searching, we want to make sure the job fits for you. Maybe even take some time and ask yourself, does my current job fit for me? That can be a really helpful place to start. I did not do this with my first job out of college. Um, it really was just the first one that came along. I was excited. It was a salary. And I took the first one that was offered to me. If I had done a little bit of research, if I had really kind of asked more of the important questions that we're going to get to in just a moment, um, I would have realized that this was not going to be a job for me. The people that worked there did not value autonomy. They did not value creativity or collaboration. It was very much almost like a dictatorship from the top down. It felt very stifling. And I ended up being very upset all the time. It was, uh, I felt very overworked. I was burnt out within the first couple months and it really just did not fit for me. And so that was a huge lesson for me to make sure my next job better be aligned with my values. It better show me what I really am looking for and work-life balance, uh, fellow employees who care about my well-being who are going to invest in our relationships. There's so much that I now know because of that first job that really just did not work out for me that I need if I'm going to work somewhere. So definitely make sure when you're job searching, does it really fit? Uh, next slide, please. Yes. And then what happens after you, you know, find a job that you like, you know, most likely you'll move on to the interview process. Right. And I think that the interview process is really where those questions and at, even at the end of the interview are you're really able to shine and show a lot of yourself. And I know personally from talking to recruiters that they really appreciate people who ask questions. So we have some, you know, sample questions to ask interviewers about workplace mental health if you are scared to approach that conversation. And I say that specifically because I didn't realize the value in asking these questions until similarly like Meg, I accepted a job, you know, without even interviewing, right? Um, and not going through that process of really figuring out like what I, they expected of me. So a lot of these questions like asking about what the day-to-day -day looks like, right? Asking them about specific systems because they will talk about systems, whether it's the benefits or if they have, you know, programs, peer support groups, um, how often and asking, you know, these people who are interviewing you, whether it's your direct supervisor or someone else who works in the org, you know, how often do you work beyond your dedicated hours? What does that look like for you? And then the last one, which is my favorite, is how do you define success in this role? And I think all of these questions together, you know, picking and choosing is it allows you to gauge kind of their expectations of what they want you to do as an employee. And then you can kind of match it up and see like if your identity and your values match up to that and if you can actually fulfill those expectations. Next slide. So once you get your job, you've interviewed, you've found this job that really feels like it's going to align with your values. 
there are still some things that you can do to really dive in and make the experience uh, really come full circle. The work that you do is only part of your job if you want to really like invest in your coworkers, invest in the company itself. So let's dive into some different examples for how you can really invest in your values at work. First and foremost, we want to make sure that we are living by our values that we like and that we um, want to honor in ourselves. So doing a kind of deep dive for yourself, am I really living by my values? If I say that I value my relationship with, relationships with my coworkers, am I investing in those relationships too? Or am I waiting for my coworkers to reach out to me? Am I specifically saying, hey, friend, I want to set up like a coffee chat, 15, 30 minutes, just to meet you, just to hang out. Uh, it really takes that, that effort from us to make sure that we are existing in our values at work. We also want to make sure that we're leading by example. If we say we value work-life balance, but we don't log off until six, seven o'clock at night, we are not leading by example. And so if we have values that we want other people to honor for us, we have to do it first. You can also do things like volunteering for initiatives or even start new initiatives. This could be in the DEI space. This could be an ERG, an employee resource group. These are like the new most amazing things. Uh, it is really a peer group that is somewhere between HR and um, other employees to kind of be the go-between, figure out resources, wellness activities, things like that. They really can kind of amplify the employee voice. It's really cool. Definitely check it out. Some companies also offer peer-to-peer -peer programs where you can mentor people or be mentored. Uh, great, great options if your company has it. Or again, you can take this to leadership, take it to your supervisor and see if it's something you could do. Some companies have engagement teams. I know one of the companies I was at, um, I was on what they called the Smile Squad. We did party planning. We did wellness activities. We had surprise cupcake days. It was great. It was so much fun. So if you have an engagement team or something like that, join if it's part of your values. If it's not already a thing and it's part of your values, definitely uh, you know, think about creating it. It's a lot of fun. You can also look at integrating your values into your goal setting. So goal setting, very important for figuring out year to year how you want to grow as a person, as an employee. So see about, you know, what are my values and are my values being reflected in the goals I'm setting for myself? One of the goals I mentioned was uh, using my creativity and having autonomy. So goal for 2024 figuring out how to uh, create and develop a new video resource. You know, that could be a lot of fun. It could be a huge growing opportunity for me, something I've never done, but something I'm definitely interested in learning. Uh, you can also seek learning opportunities. LinkedIn Learning has a ton of awesome content. Uh, some companies uh, even sponsor that. That's really cool. But there's also a lot of free options for learning, like on YouTube, making sure that it's vetted. Um, instructors for, for sure, but, you know, look at learning opportunities that align with your values. And then finally, give and receive feedback. If you feel like your values are not being represented, if you feel like you're not able to live by your values, talk to a trusted supervisor, talk to an HR representative that you trust, give that feedback and make sure that you are being vocal about it in a way that is respectful and professional but definitely making sure you're standing up for yourself. We also want to make sure that we are able to receive feedback. We want to be humble and respectful enough to know that someone can come to us and share feedback and we can hear it. Um, even if it's about our values, we want to be able to have that conversation, have that discussion and make sure that we are open to hearing something that someone has to say to us while also being able to represent our values uh, in that same conversation. So next slide, please. Yeah, and lastly, we'll kind of leave you off like what it looks like when you maintain awareness of your identity at work. Um, there are some great benefits to doing so and you know, prioritizing your values 
One is that it helps negate, you know, the chance of burnout or feeling like you cannot keep doing the work that you need to, especially for people who said that one of their values is genuine relationships and, you know, learning more about their coworkers and all of that. When you show up as your authentic self, the people that are going to respond to that, you know that, you know, it's a genuine relationship. When you show up as your authentic self, it will increase your self-confidence. And, you know, when you know when you're getting good feedback from that, it'll increase your confidence to show up more, you know, maybe outside of work. Um, we talked about like fulfillment in your work and what does that look like? And when you're truly like living to your values and understanding things that you need to prioritize, you start finding that you might find more fulfillment in your work. And I think the last two are super important because something that a lot, I've been seeing a lot in the chat is like the stigma, right? Like it's hard to speak up at work. It's hard to talk to anyone else because you feel like nobody is responding the same way. And when you start prioritizing your values and, you know, showing up as your authentic self, you really set kind of this, you know, it's it really what it is about is a cultural shift, right? And it'll inspire others to seek out the same you know, awareness, whether that means, you know, talking to a supervisor, right, giving feedback to a supervisor, it'll encourage others to do that. And then lastly is ending the stigma that is associated with advocating to yourself. That is a huge problem in the workplace. And Meg, if you want to talk about that as well in your experience doing, um, you know, directing workplace mental health for NAMI, but there is a huge stigma with like what happens, what are the repercussions of speaking up if something is not if there are no systems in your workplace, right? Because you can do all you want, but at the end of the day, like you're already feeling, you know, maybe tired from work or feeling that it's not aligning to your values. So you may not have the chance or energy to do so. So yeah, Meg. For sure. Yeah. So when we think about ending the stigma, um, we actually have a um, initiative here at Maui called Stigma Free Company, where we uh, work with companies to raise awareness, first and foremost, uh, really kind of educate the employee and leadership about mental health, about mental health conditions. Um, but we know, you know, awareness education, it's not quite enough to actually make that huge culture shift that we're all looking for. Um, so we also really work to create a more caring culture at work where we are uh, working to um really bring up that compassion level, bring up that empathy level within the workplace. Uh, and then finally, we want to look at, you know, benefits, we want to look at policies, procedures, all of those things really go into uh, stigma at work and really kind of ending that stigma, making sure people feel comfortable talking about their own mental health, but also just advocating for their own values and what they need to be a healthy employee. Um, so absolutely creating, um, amplifying that education, but also then being that leader to say, hey, I'm going to talk about this so that others feel comfortable. In general, people feel more comfortable talking about themselves if someone else starts. So if I go into work and I say, hey, y'all, I'm really excited to start working on relationships at work. Who wants to join me? Who wants to say like, let's get a huge Zoom together and do the breakout rooms and like do one-on-one -on -one chats. I'm sure so many people at NAMI would want to do that. But it takes that one person to say, I'm actually going to make this happen. Um, so yeah, really, it, it takes a lot of bravery, but it takes that one person to really stand up and really start it. I will also say there are companies out there who might not be ready for that. And it's important to know that as well. Some companies are farther along in their journey with stigma, mental health, values, all of that beautiful stuff. Um, and so it's, it is important to know kind of where your company is at with that. Um, maybe having conversations with trusted people first, see if there can be any traction. But yeah, definitely knowing your company is important whenever you're dealing with stigma and some more vulnerable personal items. Awesome. So that is all of our information today. Um, thank you all so much for being here. We are gonna do a Q and A, um, but you can definitely follow us on NAMI Communicate um, on X and Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Our NAMI helpline is 
open and available. That is the number, crisis number 988. You can call or text that number. Pass that one around. It's new. It's awesome. Um, if you want to take the stigma-free company initiative back to your workplace, QR code is up top. And then learning more about NAMI's youth and young adult initiatives, that QR code is on the bottom. Both are fabulous, and we'd love to hear from y'all in the Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in. Thank you so much, Megan, Alex. That was wonderful. Um, so so I'm, I'm watching the chat, and, and there's so many thank yous and saying this isn't typically discussed. So I'm so glad that we were able to touch on some of these helpful uh, resources. I do have a few questions that I wanted to ask you all. Um, so one question that came in was, how, how do you find the balance when you love your field of work, but it is inherently toxic, such as medical fields expecting you to work with a lack of resources, lack of providers, and long hours as default? Yeah, it is absolutely difficult in those fields that are just inherently prone to burnout. Um, I mean, as a therapist, I've definitely seen this in myself and my colleagues. Um, it's, it is important to notice how you are working during the day. I mean, for myself, I needed to take even just five minutes between my clients. I would you know, go to the bathroom, even if I didn't need to go to the bathroom and I just hang out in there alone. I might even turn the lights off and just like have a little moment to myself to like do my deep breathing do my mindfulness and just hang out and reset um to then go back out see my client but it is you know we can do some of that work some of that mindfulness some of that uh grounding work sometimes the workplace is just too unhealthy <laughs> to really allow a healthy way of living um, sometimes it really just is not possible in certain fields of work right now. And it's, it is honestly a humongous, humongous problem. Yeah. Yeah. I can share a little personal, this is something that happened to me recently. Cause I, you know, in the past year, like completely changed my career path. And even though that's not for everyone, it is important to acknowledge that there is another path. I think that's something that is very hard to acknowledge is like when we're really passionate about a field and when we grow up, maybe we went to school for that. Maybe we spent all of our twenties, like interviewing, you know, not a personal thing, but um, yeah, maybe we, we, we did that and we fostered that. And I think that's, comes into our conversation of workplace identity, right? For me, it was because I tied too much of my work to my identity. You know, when I was studying that and, you know, doing that old career path, I tied it too much to my identity and only saw myself as that person. And then I think as I experienced that toxic workplace, for me, it was research, right? Science research. So like, again, long hours, sometimes you're not sleeping because you have to you know, watch an experiment or something like that. Um, and unrealistic expectations sometimes. And I think it's really, again, evaluating your values, right? Do I value this job so much that I'm letting it interfere with some of my other values, like creativity, sleep, you know, my mental health, and then also realizing and not being afraid to veer away from that identity and maybe forming a new one. Maybe that's what it means sometimes, right? We talked about change in identity. Sometimes it means crafting a new identity and finding yourself in a different job that maybe aligns better with your workplace mental health. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Alex. That was beautifully said. Right. So there was also a question that was asked specifically, what are employee resource groups? Yeah, so employee resource groups, um, they look a little different company to company, but they're really focused on employee wellness and all different parts of employee wellness. So uh, there might be one ERG in a company that focuses on all, all pieces. Some have broken up ERGs like the mental health ERG, uh, the physical health ERG, like some do it different ways. But really what they do is they support the employee in a way that HR really can't. So it's more of that peer access that they offer, um, almost like a safer group to go to if you don't feel that you can go to HR. Honestly, it's also great for HR because 
HR doesn't want to go to HR either. <laughs> so it's a great way for HR to even feel like they have a safe place to go to. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of that in-between group that helps employees have a strong advocate um, to HR, to leadership, especially around benefits times. They, have, um, they often can really advocate for benefits that employees want uh, that are kind of talked about and explored during those wellness events. But yeah, they're really, they're really wonderful and they can be really tailored to what each company needs. Great. Thank you for that explanation, Meg. Um, what would be the best way to request accommodations for a mental health condition? So first, definitely going to someone that you trust, <laughs> um, someone that maybe uh, maybe is an HR, maybe ERG, maybe even your supervisor, just depending on the relationships that you have. Um, you don't have to disclose your specific diagnosis. It can be helpful to do that in some instances, but you don't have to. Um, it is also helpful. As a therapist, I have done this where I've written a letter of support for accommodations for my client without mentioning diagnosis at all. Uh, and it was fully accepted by their uh, HR department. So um, first, finding someone you trust that you feel like you can really talk to and then finding some support for those accommodations really goes a long way. And that can be your primary care doctor, it can be a psychiatrist, it can be a therapist, really anyone who can bill to insurance, honestly. Um, but yeah, it's it can definitely be a tricky, a tricky conversation to have. Um, so talking it over with someone first is also very helpful. Yeah, and I'd I'd like to add to like I do I don't like disclosing my like mental illness or any type of diagnosis to my employers. I, I like I just it's boundaries, right? And I think for me it starts with talking about because at the end of the day, if your employer is not really ready to have that conversation about mental health, then they're probably not gonna understand right off the bat if you mention mental health. But if you do start conversations with them talking about how you're feeling like just how you're feeling right like hey I've been finding it hard to wake up in the mornings and how it's affecting your work and I think for employers who aren't ready to have that conversation about mental health well they are ready to have a conversation about your work in that place and like how maybe you're hitting deadlines or this and that and I think stressing the importance of how you feel and how that's contributing to um, your workflow and your product, your deliverables, right? I think having that conversation is a good way to broach it and how most most of the time I start conversations with my supervisors. Right. That was a really great point, Alex, you know, and really just making it more about like a concrete situation and, and working together to, you know, find a solution for that. That's, thank you for touching on that. So Alex, I got a question in for you that wanted to ask, what would you say is the most important thing uh, for you to share for young people coming into the workforce or who are currently in the workforce for around their values and um, mental health in the workplace? Yeah, I think the most, wow, that's a, that's a big question. The most important thing. I think this is something that is very personal to me and it's just about like, don't be in a rush to find yourself. I think it's as young people, we always want to like, you know, impress and be the best and feel like we need to be farther along in our career than we actually physically can. Um, but I think it's super important to give yourself grace in those times. So for me, like I went through a giant career shift. I'm not even working in the field that I majored in in college, not using my degree, right? And that was really, you know, at first troubling for me because that was my identity. You know, I went to school for environmental science and I'm a social media manager and how does that fit? But I think also it's about being kind to yourself because if I look at myself now, like, I am fulfilling my values. I'm being creative. I am making, you know, enough to live by like my means and to support my lifestyle. But at the same time, I am also maybe not as burnt out as I was in that other career. And I, and I told myself, I tried it, right? Like I did it and I tried it and it just didn't work for me. And I think being patient with yourself, like I said, this is not my dream job. I don't think I'll ever find my dream job, but that's okay. As long as I'm living by my values. So.
So another question that came in was, how do you set those boundaries around your values and work-life balance if your employer is not receptive to that? That can definitely be a difficult one if you've tried to set those boundaries and your workplace is pushing back. Um, that might be the time to go to HR and start that discussion on uh, what you need to stay healthy. Um, it doesn't even need to be an accommodations talk, anything very formal. It can just be that start of the conversation. I'm feeling unsupported in my role. Uh, what are my options? What are my resources? Um, if you feel like you want to continue that conversation with maybe your supervisor, your manager, whoever you talk with first, try to emphasize that by holding these boundaries for yourself, you will actually be able to do a better job because you're going to have more energy for it. Oftentimes we tend to think that if we just push through a little bit, just go past our boundaries a little bit, stay till 536, we'll just get the job done and then we'll be back tomorrow and we'll start over. But that's not really how it works. If, if we push through till 536, 630, that starts being the expectation, that starts being the end of our day, we start ending up with less and less energy and our productivity falls. And so really explaining, I will be a better worker if I can sign off at the end of the day, if I can rest, if I can recuperate, recharge, uh, I want to do a good job, I want to be there for my fellow employees, and I need to be able to sign off and rest in order to do that. Um, so yeah, really reiterating that it is for the benefit of the job and for your fellow worker that you have and keep those boundaries. Yeah, I will also add in my past job, I did not find that at work and that was okay. Right. But I found means of support outside. So like I joined this support group on LinkedIn and it was just like a career support group. Right. But then I found out that everyone was experiencing similar issues in the field. And I was like, okay, this is great. But I think ultimately, you know, my first reaction to my employers not being receptive about it, it may not have been that I had, it was time for me to go. But I think through talking to those people and finding that peer support, that ultimately led me to the decision to leave. So I think, again, it's not one or the other, or it's not always going to work out for you, right? So you just, you might have to come to that answer, maybe take the long route, so. Wonderful. So we keep having questions coming in. I, I do want to pay attention to time for everyone. Uh, for those of us on the East Coast, it is getting really close to bedtime. So we want we want to be respectful of time. I'm, I think we can probably fit in just a couple more questions. Um, one that came in was, do you have suggestions for how to advocate for resources? Is that the workplace may be hesitant to implement, implement because of funding. So I think it's kind of a question too around return on investment. Yes. So first, there are lots of good free resources. But second, the World Health Organization actually did a fabulous study that shows for every dollar that a company invests in mental health, they see a $4 return. That is huge. And so just even taking that little statistic <laughs> to your employer to show them, hey, if we invest in our employee wellness, particularly in their mental health, we all feel better and do a better job at work, come to work and be a little bit happier, be a little bit peppier because we're actually healthy people. <laughs> so yes, $1 investment, $4 return. World Health Organization. Who doesn't want to make three extra dollars? I know. <laughs> oh, it's that easy. <laughs> Just take it to the dollar and cents. Um, <clears throat> sorry. What advice would you give to the person who may be creating the health and wellness program for their school or workplace? Um, yeah, I can briefly answer and then Meg, I want to hear too. Meg has great stats and uh, information. Um, I think no matter what, for like whenever you're creating a program, it should always be informed with 
um, by like diversity, right? And so like have making sure that there are employees, but I also think that there should be like high, like higher, like manager level people because it can't just be all the employees like, you know, sitting in a room talking about that, right? There needs to be, there needs to be higher ups, you know, management in that conversation as well so that they can genuinely hear, you know, what kind of problems they're tackling. Yeah, that's, that's my two cents. What about you, Meg? Yeah, I would definitely um, add in some trauma training. Um, That is very, very important this day and age for school systems to be trained, for teachers especially to have uh, trauma-informed training. Um, So yeah, DEI, trauma, um, I think those two would be the biggest. but yeah, I'd start there. And it just so happens that NAMI will be releasing a free trauma awareness training for youth serving professionals in, in June of next year. A, a little plug there. Fabulous. It's be <laughs> so we've got one more question that I think we can fit in here. So someone said, my clients have difficulty identifying what their strongest values are. Does anyone suggest resources around that to support them? So I have a therapist friend who actually does a great values exercise where uh, she cuts out all these like 80 different values and she has one column where it's, if you couldn't live by this value, you would not be healthy. Like it, it would be a core part of yourself. And if you couldn't live by this, you would just feel like you were lost. And so it can be helpful to have that kind of visual layout. That's a fun exercise, Uh, but breaking it up a little bit more than just like very important, important, not important. It's like, these are my core living values. Um, yeah, that, that's just one idea that popped in my head. Alex, any ideas from you? <laughs> yeah, we got to end this session with the bang. And for me, it's definitely, like I said in that, you know, one slide, right? Le- el- widening your network and deciding your non-negotiables. Like mm-hmm. I am an introvert, but I am the best at DMing people on LinkedIn and reaching out to people online because that's, you know, what feels comfortable to me. Um, And I think by doing that, I find that a lot of hiring managers are actually very receptive to talk about maybe the position you're applying to or even the company itself, right? Because at the end of the day, as much as you're trying to find a job that's the right fit, they're trying to find an employee that's the right fit. So you just have to keep that in mind when you're looking at these jobs and you're maybe afraid to reach out to someone is that they want to know know you right um so yeah that's kind of how I've done it is talking to people who are in the field maybe that I want or a completely different field and just having a coffee chat with them I kind of do that a lot where I just reach out to people and you know ask them how they're doing in their work do they feel fulfilled by their work so yeah Wonderful. Well, with that, we are at time. Thank you again to Meg and Alex for just sharing all of their experiences and perspectives. We appreciate it so much. And for those who stuck with us to the end, um, wanted to share to please keep an eye out, follow us on our socials, um, sign up for our newsletters and, and email blasts because we will have two more webinars in this series with the next one being in late February. And we hope you can join again. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.